Thank you for checking out this movie review. This is for the 1985 horror film Fright Night. And when I'm posting this, I know, I'm sorry, today is the 34th anniversary day for the movie Reanimator. Trust me, I am working on a review for Reanimator that should be out within the next week or so. Uh, within October, it will happen. Trust me, it's coming. So sorry it's not the day of the anniversary. I actually totally forgot about it until today. And I was like, oh, I see on social media it's the day for Reanimator. And so it's going to be later, but it's coming. So please forgive me with this particular review for Fright Night if... It doesn't seem to flow the same as a lot of my other ones. A lot of the reviews I do, I watch the movie and I'll either record that review the same day or like the day after. With this instance, it's a few days after I've watched it. Actually, uh, maybe about a week since I watched it. I just haven't had time to sit down and record. But um, So yeah, so the 1985 film Fright Night, not talking about the remake. There was a remake. I have not seen the remake. And I know some people are going to kind of internally gasp when I say this. I have not seen... Fright Night Part 2. I think it's called Part 2. The other one done in the 80s. Uh, I have not seen the second, original second Fright Night. So, apologies. So this, uh, the 1985 Fright Night was written and directed by one Tom Holland, who was also involved with Child's Play, the original Child's Play, and the movie Thinner, which in my opinion, Thinner is very underrated. That doesn't get talked about enough, uh, but watch it. If you haven't seen Thinner, Trust me, it's a good one. I like Tom Holland. I like the stuff he's been involved with. Child's Play is good, obviously. Uh, big name in this one, obviously, is Chris Sarandon. He's been involved in The Sentinel. He was also in Tri Child's Play and best known to horror people, The Nightmare Before Christmas after Fright Night. Uh, to real horror geeks, I think he's most known for his role as Jerry Dandridge in Fright Night. And then after that, probably Nightmare Before Christmas. Uh, we also have Roddy McDowell in this film, who was in The Legend of Hell House, and a crazy amount of older films, because if you look on his imdb.com credits, he has a lot of acting credits. The man has chops. For the most part, the acting in this film is very good. I can't really think of any performances that are bad, except some people would say that, I'm blanking on his name at the moment, but the guy who plays Evil Ed in this film... Some people would say that his acting is bad. It is very over the top, but for some reason, I feel like it works because he's supposed to be kind of funny. So I feel like his over the top brand of acting actually, I don't know, just plays with that character. It, it just fits. And maybe part of that's just because I've watched this movie a bunch of times. So it just makes sense in that role because I'm used to it. I don't know. That's a, that's a possible thing. So there was a sequel to this in 1988. And then there's a remake in 2011. And then there was a sequel to the remake in 2013. So all those ones I just referenced, I've not seen them. So sorry, I can't really make any comparisons. That would be a whole nother video. And I might do something like that. I know there was one person who had requested that I do a comparison video of the old versus new Suspiria. Which I do have plans to do that at some point. Um, there was even a Bollywood. Yes, a uh, Indian... Hollywood, uh, Bollywood remake of Fright Night in 1989. Who knew? I certainly didn't until I did this research. So, but what I did know is that there's an amazing, amazing documentary. I've talked about this documentary before on other movie review videos I've done. Uh, one of my favorite, actually, at the moment, I'm going to say I think it's my favorite documentary film about horror at the moment called You're So Cool, Brewster. It's a documentary about the making and behind the scenes of Fright Night. And it's like, I think it's a little over two hours, but it is so worth the time. Uh, the amount of stuff that they get into with like the practical effects and how cutting edge they were, which I didn't know that until watching that documentary. That like at that time when this film was being done, that the practical effects they were doing, a lot of that stuff was being pioneered on the set, which is amazing. So if you're a fan of Fright Night, You're So Cool, Brewster, the documentary is a must, must, must watch, in my opinion. So check that out now. Uh, Tom Holland wrote the script for uh, for himself to direct for the original Fright Night because he didn't like what had been done with previous scripts of his. So he had had a few instances where he wrote up some scripts, other people directed the stuff, and so he went into this one and said, look, 
I'm writing it and it's for me to direct. And if this film's being made, it's me and it's me only because I've had some bad experiences with people not doing what the script says to do, basically. Uh, McDowell's role was originally written for Vincent Price, people should know, who wasn't accepting roles at that time. Uh, so they wanted to see if they could get Vincent Price, but he said, I'm not doing roles anymore. I'm kind of done with this stuff. But obviously, we have the very strong homage to Vincent Price in the character of Peter Vincent, but it's also an homage to Peter Cushing as well, two guys who are very well known in horror from older films. So Vincent Price and Peter Cushing, Peter, or Peter Vincent. <laughs> I, I was throwing too many names out there. I got lost real quick. So Sarandon didn't actually want to do a horror film, by the way. But he ended up reading the script to this, and he fell in love with it. He he literally, when was, he was given the script, he was just like, oh, it's a horror film? Don't want to do it. But then they were kind of like, well, I'll just read the script. And he's like, all right, I'll read the script. Read through it, and he was like, actually, I really love this thing. I've never wanted to do horror before, but let's do it. So, very cool. Tom Holland actually got lucky when he was making this because the studio, Columbia, was so unbelievably focused on uh, the movie Perfect, uh, the movie's called Perfect, I've never seen it. it, had John Travolta and Jamie Lee Curtis in it, so they were so focused on that film, which was being filmed at the same time, that they just left him alone, basically. There was pretty much no studio interference with this film, which is probably why we got the product that we did with this right now, which is awesome. Uh, there was issues with actually some injuries during the production, but also the cutting-edge practical effects, like I was talking about, um, Watch the documentary for more on that information. Yeah, there were injuries. They talk about the injuries on that documentary. And some of that stuff's pretty scary, to be honest. And it gives you the idea that I've also seen with some other documentaries about doing, like, these cutting-edge practical effects and figuring things out on set as you go that, yeah, it can be dangerous. And I think about those situations. I'm like, as an actor, I'd probably be like, eh, I don't know about this right now. So, um, all right, so... We are about to get into the spoilers, so if you're watching this and you haven't seen the movie, turn around, go watch the movie, and come back, because it's all spoilers from here on out. That's how I'm doing things. All right, so one of the things I really love about this film is it immediately starts by connecting with horror nerds, horror fans. You have Charlie watching his old, um, his old te well, old to us now, his old television, watching um, Vin Peter Vincent's... Uh, show i forget what it's called but he's basically in in a role kind of like an elvira or sven gooley or what have you so late night horror movie host so i really like that touch i think that's a really good way to immediately connect to your audience and say hey this movie's for you we recognize you this kid in particular this main character is supposed to be kind of like you guys and i really like that touch to it um there's good comedy in this, I think. I think the, and this is something I talk about a lot of times, especially with horror when you're trying to mix some comedy in with it, you can have it go very, very wrong. You can do too much comedy or the little bit of comedy that you do throw in can feel like a speed bump that kind of jars you and takes you out of the moment and just doesn't jive with the rest of the feel of it. But this film, I think, does a really good job of mixing it in there and making it feel right. And I think part of that is also the time like uh, in the 80s there were a lot of movies kind of like that where like for the most part they were pretty serious about what they were portraying but they would throw comedy in there and i think they were written well nowadays it's not done as well in my opinion i don't know why that is but like one of the one of the really funny things that happens early on to let you know like we're gonna have comedy in this film and and just be prepared is how uh, Charlie just can't pay attention like he wants to get laid he's trying to get it on with Amy and then immediately like he loses focus and she can't get his attention because uh, all he wants is to get laid and then she's like fine I'm ready to do this and he's just so focused on who he's now seeing is he doesn't know him he's Jerry Dandridge at the, at the moment but whoever moved in next door and is biting some woman yeah uh, so this does a good job of showing how tough it is in high school, actually. There's a, there's this awkwardness that goes throughout the film that you see in all the characters. Um, and I'll talk about that at the very, very end of like, you know, some issues that every character kind of deals with, but I think it gives a really good overall feel of the awkwardness of high school, the awkwardness of trying to figure out your sexuality, 
And it's, it kind of seems like it's not just the high school kids. I mean, obviously, Ed, um, he's not he's not dealing with the sexuality portion of it at all because he he never brings up sex or anything like that. But obviously, Charlie and Amy are very much uh, feeling awkward about sex. You know, Charlie's trying to have sex. And, and it's an awkward situation because he's being rebuffed. And then Amy doesn't really want to have sex. But then she's like, oh, okay, maybe we can give it a shot. And then she's being rebuffed at the same time. So it's like this very confusing thing. And then you also have like Jerry Dandridge, who he's a vampire. And he's getting close to all these women. But it actually seems like there are a lot of gay undertones in this film. Where there's something going on between he and Billy. Um, his... I don't know what you want to call him, like servant? I don't know, his helper, his roommate? I don't know. But there are a lot of actual kind of, uh, they, they allude to the fact that they're involved. Like some of the ways that they'll touch each other and give like a longer look. And there's actually one particular scene that has to, has to, has to be super intentional. Um, and if you didn't catch it, go back and rewatch this and think about it. <clears throat> the part where Jerry Dandridge has had his hand stabbed by the pencil that Charlie got him with after he had broken into his house one night, um, when he's getting that wound taken care of by Billy and, and he's on the phone with um, Peter Vincent, so Billy's taking care of his hand and it shows Billy on his knees, like crouched down, taking care of his hand as Jerry Dandridge is standing up, so his hand's down below his waist. And so he's, it shows him taking care of it. Well, then the camera pans over and starts panning up. And while it starts panning up, Billy turns his head exactly so that it looks like he is filleting Jerry Dandridge. And he holds like that as they slowly pan upward onto Jerry. It is totally intentional if you watch that. The timing and the movements with the timing, it has got to be intentional. And that's where it leads to what I'm saying about that, you know, sexual relationship between Billy and Jerry. And so there's that sexual confusion with Jerry Dandridge as well, where much like the high school kids, like he doesn't know what to do because obviously in order to get his meals, he has to be sexually involved with women because that's how he gets them in close. Granted, they're all prostitutes, but you know, it's fast food. Oh my God, it's Grubhub. It's totally Grubhub before Grubhub. Wow. That's like pizza delivery back then, but it's like Grubhub. Um, so, yeah. Uh, the amount of sexuality actually in this is very high, and that's something that should be pointed out because with vampire films and vampire books and just vampire stories in general, there has typically been a lot of sexuality involved because they're, they are supposed to be like very sexual monsters. I don't even know when that started. Um, cause I know it, I don't think it always was like that, but, but they have the power of seduction and f they play that up a lot, you know, and let's be honest, like Chris Sarandon, he's a good looking dude and they make him seem like a good looking dude. And they play that up a lot within this with him getting on with the ladies and how sexual and sensual all those scenes are, but also his just overall acting and, and his smoothness, he like oozes sexuality. I mean... Charlie's mom wants to get with him. Obviously, she talks about it, like, to her son, which is funny and weird. Uh, yeah, so tons of sexuality. It, like, oozes from this movie. The twist of vampires being able to eat food is an interesting one, especially when you see, well, I think the only time you really see it is, like, Jerry eats apples here and there. And that's something that I think prior to this film wasn't really being done with vampires. I think that was kind of a new thing that Tom Holland brought up, which is, hey, they can eat food, that's fine. It's just not their main source of food that gives them nutrients. And I like that because it's all. it also serves as kind of a red herring to try and throw you off early on because you're like, oh my God, he's a vampire. But then you're like, oh, well, maybe Charlie's just seeing things. Maybe he's not a vampire because he's eating an apple. And what do we know? What do we all know about vampires? They suck blood. That's what they eat. So I like that little touch. It's a cool little touch. Yeah, oh, if you didn't notice this, so when uh, Charlie comes home from school and Jerry has been, uh, he has been invited into the house by Charlie's mom, which I think that's a funny moment because he had like just spoken to Evil Ed about, you can't, 
you know, vampires you can't bring uh, allow them into your house. They have to have be have to be given permission to come into the house. And then he goes home and immediately finds out, oh, he's already been given permission from my horny mom. <laughs> and he's just like, D come on now, you're gonna kill us both. So he um that moment he stands up when he sees him and he was like oh your mom made me a drink if you notice it's not like he doesn't really like hold it up or anything it's like he's holding it down but he has a bloody mary so i think that was kind of like a subtle funny little thing to look for in the film i like that uh oh and i i wrote down there isn't much of anything scarier than having an intruder in your house to be honest like that is a scary situation so when they have the whole setup where he's already been invited in the house and then that night, I think it's that night, he's on the roof, like he hears him, you know, the pitter-patter on the roof and he does break into the house, uh, it's it's intense and it's, it is a pretty scary tense moment and I liked how that played out. And I mean, there's a moment where you kind of think, Charlie might be getting bitten here and then there'd, and then there'd be two vampires. There is very strong foreshadowing, actually, that happens during that whole home invasion scene where uh, Amy's framed picture gets knocked out of the window and it's falling down and it gets impaled by the top of a wooden fence. So that is strong foreshadowing that she is going to become a vampire. Just saying. Because a wooden fence post going through her picture. I like that foreshadowing. There's also the foreshadowing when evil ed is playing his trick being like oh god oh god he bit me he bit me and then revealing that it's a joke but he says to him oh my gosh he bit me i'm turning you're gonna have to kill me he says that to charlie that's another strong foreshadowing moment because then that ends up happening it isn't charlie who ends up killing him well and you can even question whether he's even dead based on the very end when you see like the eyes and you hear his laugh i don't know how he would have survived but I don't know. I guess that's just one of those things. There are a lot of those things in uh, in older horror movies, especially in the 80s, where they would just, like, do the movie, and then they'd be like, but you have to throw something in on the end that suggests we could do a sequel, just in case this makes really good money. And that kind of felt like one of those moments to me, where it was just like, it doesn't actually make sense, and they were just like, we just gotta throw something in there so we can maybe do a sequel. So, I don't know. But I really like those those foreshadowing touches. I think they're cool. Uh, already, yeah, I already talked about this. Definitely the gay undertone between Jerry and Billy. And I actually think that a lot of the people who are involved in this film actually were gay. Well, I'm sorry, were gay, if they're not alive anymore, are gay still, if they're alive. Uh, if you look at Charlie from an outsider perspective, he legitimately seems crazy. And that speaks to how good the writing and acting is for this film. Because, like, as an audience member, you're in on it. Like, you know relatively early on that Jerry Dandridge is, in fact, a vampire. Even though they have, like, a few little things that make you question a little bit. But if you're watching the film and you step back from it and say, okay, pretend I don't know that. Pretend as an audience member I'm not told that stuff yet. If I'm a person in this film, if I'm, like, one of Charlie's friends or his mom or whatever, and he's acting the way he's acting, what do I think? He seems crazy. And the way it's written and acted, it seems realistic that he would say those things in that situation and that the people would react to him the way they do. And like I said, it's great writing. It's great acting. It's done very well. I'm a fan. Uh, the film maintains tension, which is very impressive a lot of times. It's hard to just keep tension throughout a film, especially when the runtime's around an hour and a half or more, which I think this one's... Maybe a little over an hour and a half. Might be about an hour. I think it's like an hour and 45 minutes, basically. Uh, so it's hard to do. But um, I actually don't think that some of the sound effects in this film hold up now. I understand that was acceptable back in the 80s. But for the most part, for the most part, it's fine. But there are a few sound effects that sound really corny. I can't remember a specific one off offhand. But I did write it down in my notes. So there was, obvi there was obviously a few sound effects. I was like, oh, that sounds terrible. Um let me know in the comments if you can think of any off the top of your head. Uh, the moment where Evil Ed is bitten he and he actually accepts it is actually a really sad moment. Like, you don't expect it to go that way when he's being stalked in the alley. You expect it to just be like a vicious scene. But Jerry Dandridge is basically like, 
I know what it's like being different and I can help you. You know, I can make you not have to deal with the pain of that because it is easily, I mean, it's very well set up in the beginning that he is an outcast. You know, uh, he gets called evil by Charlie, who's even a friend of his, and he hates it. He responds and is like, don't call me that, and he seems legitimately mad about it. So, you, you like, you see the pain. He starts to cry when Jerry, you know, is telling him this stuff, like, I know about being different and everything. And think about this. It, it gives a little more depth to Jerry as a character because it gives him some heart, too. Oh, my cat's going off. Sorry. He, it gives him some heart as well because he could have just come in and done what everyone expects him to in that instance and just be like, now you're mine, bite him, and it's over, or bite him and fully drain him and kill him. But for but for some reason, he, he has a little humanity in him still, and he has compassion for people to a degree. Granted, his perspective on how to save people is very different, uh, but, you know. But that's one of those instances of he's looking at evil Ed and he's saying, I'm not going to kill you. I, I recognize some of what I'm going through in you and I can give you a better life. I won't kill you right now when I could have, I could easily do that basically. And it's just, it's a sad moment. It's acted very well, written very well. Like I was saying before, uh, the scene with Jerry and Amy then where they're getting, sexual uh it, it's very centrally done it's shot in a very tasteful yet sexual way uh it's almost kind of a sweet moment and it's almost a it's another one of those glimpses into jerry's humanity where it makes you feel the way it's going like he he might not bite her in the end because of the way it seems he's actually feeling about her and it, it's it, it's a little bit of like a rekindling a flame with a lost love. And a lot of that having to do with, you know, the woman who was in the painting. So, because they look, because she and Amy look alike. Uh, I don't get the whole thing with Ed turning into a wolf. Like, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, I know that there's some mythology having to do with vampires and werewolves where they kind of like came out of the same... Um, origin and and it was like a split between vampire and werewolf so they are still kind of tied together so i don't know if it was coming from that type of mythology or what but within the context of this movie him turning into a wolf doesn't make any sense because jerry bit him so you would assume that he would just turn into a vampire and like a bat and then a vampire whatever just like amy but um the good thing though is suspending that from the story and not caring about that the uh the practical effects for and the makeup for the werewolf for evil Ed as a werewolf as a wolf and the werewolf is phenomenal i mean obviously it looks amazing it is practical effects wise it's my favorite part of the movie i know a lot of people really like you know the messed up smile with the jagged teeth that are are ends up being on amy's face which i really like that one too but I think the the werewolf portion is amazing. And it's also sad. Like, that whole death scene is incredibly sad. I feel like that carries... Um, it carries over well from, from the really sad moment in the alley when he's initially being bitten. It's kind of like the end portion of it. And you see him turning back into just Ed. And, you, it, like, you can see the horror on, on uh, Peter Vincent's face where he's... He's just kind of like, like in the moment, I'm killing this this creature that I have to kill. But then when he's watching him die and turn back into a human being, he's like feeling for him. He's like, but that was this kid. And like, he's turning back into him and there's a humanity again and who he was as a kid. And he feels terrible. Like you can see it on his face. It's just like, it's, it's a very emotional moment, in my opinion. A lot of impact. So then there's a question. Um, did Jerry reanimate billy because i thought billy gets killed on the stairs and go and falls down but and then jerry comes out and then he ends up getting back up so i thought he was dead so i don't understand that whole thing i don't get it like so can someone put a comment down there like do you think that he reanimated him or something i don't know or was he just not dead all along and then the other thing is like i also don't get what is billy like, what is he? Because 
He's not a vampire, clearly. He has a reflection. We saw that when Peter Vincent initially came over. You could see him in the in the um, mirror. He has a reflection. He's not a vampire. But what is he? Because when he gets killed, he's, he's just like turns into green goop that just like oozes away. What is he? Like, I want some sort of explanation. Like, what is this dude? I don't know. That's confusing. Much like the whole Ed turning into a werewolf. That's confusing. Uh, the other thing is, do vampires just grow hair at will? Because when Amy turns into a vampire, her hair is automatically longer. It's the weirdest thing. Or is that just like a continuity issue? I don't know. Also put a comment down there on that. That was also weird. Um... The part where Peter Vincent is starting to gain faith when he's trying to use the crucifix against Jerry Dandridge is really corny. Like, that is a scene I actually hate in this movie. That's a portion I think does not hold up very well. It was really dumb. I think it was dumb when it was done. Um, it's just like, it's it's not a good moment. It's just not. And, the, and I think that the way Chris Sarandon acts that portion as Jerry Dandridge is really funny and not in a good way. It's like a crappy, corny funny because when it starts to work, he's like, <gasps> you know what I'm talking about? It's, it's like, <laughs> I, I laugh at that. I'd like laugh out loud at that portion. But for the most part, I, I like this film quite a bit, as you can tell. Uh, they went all out in the end with the practical effects. It kind of seems like for the most part, they saved the practical effects and we're like, okay, let's shoot this movie chronologically. Then when we get to the end, we'll know how much of our budget we pretty much have for the end portion. And then we'll just throw in as many practical effects as we feel like we can afford. Which, you know, that's not a bad approach if that's what they did. It seems like that's what they did. Uh, but the practical effects are just like, they keep coming and coming and coming at the end. And... It's awesome. It's a good payoff. I like it. Okay, so my, the final thing I'm going to talk about are uh, personal fears. Like, I feel like in general, well, I don't say in general. Overall, this film is about personal fears big time. So for Charlie, it's about losing people. You know, he has a lot of people to lose. He's very scared about losing people, even people he doesn't know. You know, saving society from the vampire, losing potentially losing his mother, potentially losing Amy. He loses the evil Ed, you know, like... He could lose everyone, and that becomes, that's at stake and known to be at stake very early on when he has interactions with Jerry, and Jerry's just like, I could take everyone from you, basically, and he threatens him that way. Um, like, when he breaks in, and he, he tells him that he could kill his mom very easily. Uh, for Amy, it's the sexual involvement. That's one of her personal fears. You see that very early on. She's very afraid to get sexual to open up in that way with Charlie, Um that's her personal fear in this. Uh, with Evil Ed, it's being an outcast. That's his big fear of never being accepted by anyone. Obviously, he's living it throughout most of the film, but he is then accepted with you know with Amy and, and Charlie, and then he finds his ultimate acceptance in the end with Jerry. Not that he wanted that, really, but he does accept it in the end. I don't know. So I would like to know what was... The, what was going through the character's head in those moments. Uh, and then you have Jerry who is losing his comfort in life post-humanity. Um, he, he seems to be having a personal fear of losing humanity altogether. Like he's trying to stay human to some degree. I think that's part of him eating apples is it makes him feel more human uh, he has those more human moments like where he decides not to kill evil Ed like we were talking about or where he kind of lets up on Charlie. Uh, he even says that the part where he um, when he breaks into the house, he, he he's holding him up and he gives him a choice. He even says it. he's like, I, you know, I'm going to give you a choice, which is, which is something I never had. And that line is a direct look into his psyche, like who he is. Like he still thinks about his humanity. He still mourns the loss of being a straight up human. He is doing what he needs to do to survive as a vampire, but he's still thinking about being a human and wishes he was a human. And it's just those little moments that are kind of littered throughout the film that give you those glimpses. It's, it's not like this long diatribe. It's just these little, little bits that you pick up on and you're just like, he's not a total monster. I mean, overall, the, the over, 
the overwhelming percentage of him is a monster, but there are pieces of humanity still left in him. And I think that's one of the big strengths with this. Anyway, um, so that that's all I have to say about Fright Night. Sorry, I had a lot on Fright Night. I'm like at a half an hour. I apologize, people. Hopefully people watch this. Um, but, okay, so now to give it a rating out of five stars with half stars in play. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go... Um, I'm going four and a half on this one. I think it's a really good one. Uh, directed really well, acted really well, writing's really good. The story has a lot to say. It's funny, it's uh, scary, it's tense, and it's impactful, and it's emotional, and it has a lot to say. There's so much to it. But uh, thank you, everyone, for checking this out. If you could do me one quick favor, hit that subscribe. It means a lot for my channel. Literally takes you a second, and it's painless. Uh, and put some comments down there. Let's talk about Fright Night. I like this film quite a bit. Um, so yeah, but thanks everyone for checking this out. Till next time, keep it brutal.